Let's dive into phenomenology. Phenomenologist has two tasks. The first one is pretty easy, but the second one is immensely difficult. The first task is to observe the immediate appearance of reality without making any judgments about it. We do not care, is the appearance true or is it really even real? We are just observing that which is here and now before our mind. The second task is to make generalizations of these observations. These generalizations should encompass all kinds of possible observations. And precisely there lies the difficulties. Because these generalizations should be appliable to every kind of experience and to every kind of observation. Now you can see that the first part is relatively simple. We should just focus on our experience, not on the objects themselves, meaning that as phenomenologists we don't judge whether something is beautiful, right or true, because that is the job for normative sciences. Or even contemplate, is this or that object really there or not, because that is job for metaphysics. Phenomenologists should observe the observation itself. Instead of observing the experienced object, we observe the experience of that object. By this way, the experience itself can be observed without supposing anything about the reality of what is being experienced. An experience of hallucination of a bear is as scary and as actual for the person who experiences it as an experience of a real bear would be. The experience observed is basically the same, although the reality of the experienced object is not. Phenomenologist thus asks the following questions. What is present to my mind and how it appears to my mind? But we run into problems with the second task. How can we describe and furthermore generalize the appearances that are present to the mind? How we describe the immediate appearance without making any distinctions between appearances and reality? We can't use our everyday language because it is normative, that is, it makes claims about the reality. Therefore, we need a language which is not normative and does not make a distinction between appearances and reality. The only possibility is to turn to mathematics, because it is a science that does not make claims about the reality of its objects. And this is precisely what Peirce did. He took a part of mathematics called the algebra of relations and formulated a language which we know as the three categories. The language which purrs true from the algebra of relations is in itself pretty simple. A relation has a certain number of items that relate in that instance. The order or addicity of relation is that number of relations it has. A relation can be monadic, dyadic and triadic and so on n-adic with n number of relations. A monadic relation has only one relation, x, at a time. We can represent this with the notation rx. If r means being blue, rx means that x is blue. Monadic relations are usually called properties, qualities or attributes. We know these monadic relations as firstness. A dyadic relation has two relations, x and y, at a time. We can represent this with the notation rxy if r means for example a relation of loving, rxy means that x loves y. These relations we know as secondness. A 
triadic relation has three relations, x, y and z at a time. We can represent this with the notation r, x, y, z. r, x, y, z could represent the fact that x gives y to z. And this we know as thirdness. And this is basically the language that Peirce borrowed from the algebra of relations. But now we need to connect this language to the phenomenological science, that is, the observation of experience. Peirce used a method called precision. It is an asymmetric act of abstraction, or in a more familiar terms, attending to one thing while neglecting another. For example, we can attend to space while neglecting color, but not vice versa. We can think about space without any color in it. But if we imagine a color, the color must be in a space. With the method of precision, we can build an ordered series of categories by successive steps of precision. In this manner, we are able to isolate elements of experience that are logically independent from other elements of experience. Consider the following example. You are watching the snow falling from the sky. You experience a blurry, general, unindividuated, continuous snowfall. Next, you begin to concentrate to the experience of that snowfall. You experience continuity. The snow falls to the ground as a constant stream of snowflakes. This is the experience of thirdness. You fix your eyes on a single falling snowflake. Now you have neglected the experience of the stream of snowflakes and attended to a single element in it. This is the first step of precision. Now you experience the brood actuality of this one snowflake, its individuality, its contrast to the other snowflakes. You experience the actuality of here and now. This is the experience of secondness. You can furthermore concentrate on the color of the snowflake, that is, its whiteness. You can neglect its actuality, individuality, and contrast and attend only to its quality. This is the experience of firstness. With precision, we can thus separate and identify the categories in our experience. Furthermore, with precision, we are able to investigate the relationships between the categories. Now, let's reflect our example a bit more. From this example, we can infer two kinds of relations between the categories. The focus on the quality of the snowflake, that is, its white color or firstness, is possible only through secondness. We can attend to that quality only because that particular quality has been embodied and actualized in that particular snowflake. Basically, if there weren't any snowflakes, there would not be a white color to focus on. We can thus experience quality only through the embodiment and actualization of that quality in an individual thing. We can thus say that firstness is prescindable only through secondness. By the same token, Secondness is prescindable only through thirdness. We can attend to that single snowflake only because it is a part of a continuous meteorological process. The snowflake is a part of a continuous stream of snowflakes. Although the individual snowflake is an individual embodiment, at the same time it is an embodiment of a bigger underlying process, the water cycle. Furthermore, our whole experience is continuous, meaning that in order to concentrate on any part of it, there has to be thirdness present in the experience. 
This relation is called factual dependency. An introduction of simple category depends on the more complex category. Firstness is factually dependent from secondness, which is in turn factually dependent on thirdness. The factual dependency stresses the fundamentality of thirdness. But there is also another relation between the categories. Although the simple category must be introduced through the more complex one, once the simple category is introduced, we don't have to take the more complex category into account. We can neglect it. This relation can be called logical dependency. It means that there is a logical hierarchy or order between the three categories. Thirdness is logically dependent on secondness, which is in turn logically dependent on firstness. Or we could say that firstness is logically primary to secondness, which is in turn logically primary to thirdness. Or even still we could put it this way. Firstness determines secondness, which in turn determines thirdness. Let's consider the example a bit more. We can become lost in the qualities of the individual snowflake. We don't need to consider the concrete actuality or materiality of the snowflake or the continuity that allows the experience to mediate information. The experience of the color is as itself a complete experience. In other words, firstness can be thought without secondness or thirdness. The firstness is logically primary to the other two more complex categories. Now, if we concentrate on the brute and forceful actuality of the snowflake, that is, its secondness, we must take the qualities of that embodiment into account. It is impossible to neglect the qualities of that embodiment, because for something to actualize, there must be some qualities to it. Every actualization or concrete thing has some distinct qualities. Sound, color, smell, taste, hardness, temperature, etc. Therefore, quality or firstness is logically primary to actualization or secondness. But nevertheless, the experience of the brute actuality can be thought without considering the continuity of the underlying process. We can focus on the individual snowflake and we don't have to care about the meteorological process behind the snowfall. We can focus on the single moment here and now. If we concentrate on the experience of thirdness, we have to take into account the experienced single concrete instances and moments of embodiments that constitute the current experience, that is, the secondness. And furthermore, we have to take account the qualities that have actualized in those instances, that is, firstness. Even the order itself, that is, the meteorological and physical laws, are observable only through those single concrete instances. That is why there can't be order without actualization of concrete things that constitute that orderliness. Therefore, we can say that concreteness, secondness, is primary to order, thirdness. The determination can be thought also with the following example. Think about an ant's nest. There certainly is order in the ant society. That is to say that there is an element of thirdness. However, that order is formed from millions of single ants' actions. That is secondness. Furthermore, those single actions and their actualizations have embodied all kinds of qualities. For example, the communication between the ants happens through different smells. So the order of the ant society is logically dependent on the single actions of the ants, 
which are in turn logically dependent on the qualities that actualize in those actions. In summary, factual dependency stresses the fundamentality of thirdness, continuity and mediation. That is the action of the sign or semiosis. It is also a reminder of the inseparability of the categories. Firstness is not ontologically primary to the other two categories. The categories are always together in every situation. On the other hand, logical dependency stresses the logical relationship between the categories and it forms the basic logical principle that we can find also in semiotics. Namely, that firstness determines secondness, which determines thirdness. Now, it is very important to say that this determination does not mean blind compulsion. The determination is a triadic relation. Why triadic? Because at every instance and event, all the three categories are present.